let's go ahead and get started this evening. Let's go ahead and grab that hymnal and turn to page number 20, page number 20, and let's stand and sing, praise him. Let's praise him with all tonight, amen. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor, give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reign it forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen. That's what we need to do, enter His gates with thanksgiving and praise Him tonight. And so that's what we'll do for a while. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll move on. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you tonight for, oh, your goodness and grace. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for salvation. I thank you for that way of escape that you've given to us. And I just praise you for the salvations that I've already heard of this week at camp. And dear Lord, I just praise you for that. You're just so worthy, so worthy, and we're so unworthy. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to... Holy Spirit, to indwell with us this evening and just uh, have your will and your way in everything that's done. We just want to give you the honor and the praise and the glory, and we'll just ask all this in Jesus' holy, precious, wonderful name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and take a load off, amen. I'll tell you what, after that big torrential rainstorm we had today, it was, we were here in town, and I mean, it was, you know, uh, it covered the streets, it was running in the gutters, and then it was done. <laughs> And then, and then it was about like in when I lived in New Orleans, amen, it was, about, it was about 10 minutes later, it was gone. It just all went back up in the air. So, uh, yeah, that's good. Good stuff, amen. But, hey, it was something, amen. At least we got a few drops. Now, at my house, it was, you could just see where it hit the dust, just a few little, little dots. So it was like, well, it didn't do any good out there. Everything's getting browner and browner. But uh, I tell you what, Jesus loves even me. Page number 127, 127, sing that. I am so glad that my Father in Him tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, this is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still Jesus loves me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in this beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves 
me. Jesus loves even me. Yeah, even me. Amen? That's just, I just can't get over it sometimes. I'm like, God, I'm just a pile of mess. You know, I am just such a mess. And he loves me. It's, just, I, it's yeah. But uh, I don't know if you picked up in the prayer. I, I don't know. Should I say it? Jess? I don't know. Okay, my grandsons got saved, okay? Both of them at camp. So RC, uh, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say it because they probably want to do it, but it was just, it was glorious, okay? It was just the way that it happened. And, and so John's like, no, no, you already got it. He said, no, I got to get saved now. I got to get saved now. And so they took him outside and, yeah, and it was, he was just adamant about, we got to settle this right now. And so, and it wasn't, and, and Joel got saved too, but Joel was a little different situation. Joel was, yeah, Joel approached it in a different attitude and a different, different time, wasn't it? It wasn't around the same time. It was a little bit different. So, uh, I don't know, we get all the full status. You know how it's, you know, the first news comes in, it's a little scattered. <laughs> He's got fragments, you know, but uh, I don't want to be like the media, you know. <laughs> I don't want to say something ain't true, but I do know this, that both my grandsons got saved at camp. And uh, it's, good to, it's good to have your family saved. And uh, wow, God is so good. He's so good. Hey, Brother Eric, you ready, brother? Come on up here and read us the missionary letter. Our missionary letter tonight is from Debbie Guiman. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Guiman, I wasn't pronouncing that correctly. Making a difference one life at a time. June 11th, 2023. Dear praying friends, I wasn't looking for another ministry role, but sometimes God just drops a need right into your lap, so to speak, and assures you that he's placed you there to meet that need. That happened to me recently, and I now have another way to use the gifts God's given me to show his love. On a Wednesday night at church, I sat on the row behind one of my security guards who was seated at the other end of the pew. I could see him well. I noticed that although he was listening intently, he didn't have a Bible. I didn't know if it might be because he was headed for work guarding at my house immediately after church, but God kept me thinking about it and praying about it a lot that night. I knew that almost a year ago when I had sent him to a guard company that we had been using for training so that he could become a security guard at SOAP. They had rejected him and sent him back because he couldn't write a letter of application. I had assured him that he didn't have to do that to be a good guard. I also remembered that he had told me previously that he wasn't able to go very far in school. The next morning, as soon as it was light outside, I called him to sit and talk with me. I told him first that he was one of the best security guards I've ever had, so this had nothing to do with his job. Then I asked if he had, if he had a Bible. He smiled and said that he did not have one. I then gently asked if he could read. He smiled again and admitted that he wasn't good at it. I explained that in many schools, the students are not taught the sounds that letters make, so they don't learn to read properly. I told him that many years ago, I had a program that I used to teach some ladies how to read, a teso, so they could read the Bible and could memorize verses to get their own Bibles. I then asked if he'd like me to teach him to read properly. That's when he smiled even bigger and immediately said yes. We talked another few seconds, and he quickly asked when we could start. We've had a number of lessons so far, and he is eager, he is very eager, he is a very eager learner, and sometimes, and seems to be catching on quickly. We're both excited about him eventually learning to read the Bible for himself, and I'm very thankful for the ideas God gave me 20 years ago to develop a phonics program to teach a Tesso. It's exciting to be using it again. It was also exciting recently to see several of our children and several teachers make professions of faith during a special preaching conference at SOAP. Please pray, they, pre, please pray they were genuine and that they grow in their relationship with the Father. And please pray for others who still need to make that decision. God is working. Joyfully serving him, Debbie Guyman. Let's pray for Miss Debbie really quickly. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to come together and worship you and get to know more about you. Um, Lord, I want to lift up Miss Debbie Guyman to you in prayer tonight, Lord. 
in the work that she's doing in the ministry for you. Um, just bless her with whatever ministries she has. Thank you for the opportunity you gave her to speak with her security guard and the opportunity she has to teach him on how to read and get to know the Bible so that he can personally get to know you. Um, just bless her in any way that she needs. Give her comfort, give her peace, and it's your name I pray, amen. Amen. I'll tell you what, uh, the, uh, the Stensis used to be in Uganda, and I've actually heard, I'm pretty sure that their government is having some issues right now. So any missionaries over there, it's, it's, it's not a safe thing. It's not like we are. Uh, we're losing our stuff, but, I mean, I remember when Brother Brian Stensis went over there in the early 90s and how they went, first went in and they would be in their house and they'd hear, uh, the Hutus and the Tutsis, that was the ones fighting. And they said one night it would be one way or the other way. And they would hear the, the tanks and the, the, the ammo, you know, the shells and all that stuff just banging around and said God protected them through all that. But, I mean, they were right smack in the middle of a war zone. And, you know, the troops, they would, they would shift one way or the other, and yet God protected them all those years over there. And I'll tell you what, uh, I've heard that, you know, when you're in the will of God, it's God will take care of it. He always takes care of it. When it's, when it's God's will, he'll fill the bill. So he'll take care of them no matter what. And uh, I'm glad that, that he allows them to serve all over the world and represent us in that way. So amen. Amen. Appreciate those missionaries. And uh, amen. Let's stand up and let's sing page number 477. He keeps me singing. Amen. It's about Jesus keeping me singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know.
pick it up on the fourth one. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every singing as I go. Amen. You can be seated. Numbers 22. Numbers 22 in the Old Testament, please. Amen. Tell you what, last night I was trying to get settled on stuff. I actually, I think I'm gonna grab that lapel mic. I have no idea what's gonna happen tonight. So there we go. Amen. All I know is God is good all the time. All the time. He's worthy to be praised. Test one, two, I'm good. There we go. I don't know where to put this thing. Amen. All righty. Whoa, that's loud. All right, we're all good here. We got, he's working on it. Amen. All righty. So uh, tonight, I'm going to push this down a little bit. The, uh, the text of tonight is uh, part of a, what you, what you see several times in the Bible, 99 times actually it appears, this phrase appears in the Bible. It's in the way. In the way. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're just food for thought. But they're there, amen, for a reason, all the time. So, as we're looking through this, I was, I was kind of just kind of glancing through it, kind of like a rock skipping on the, on the water. And so I was going over things, trying to look like which way do we need to be in the way? So, which way are you in the way? Okay, so you kind of see that word play, but you kind of listen, can't, just bear with me, amen? So, we're going to talk about, the first of all, we're going to talk about a guy that, uh, as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, and so they'd been in the desert for 39 years, so they're right at the end of the 40-year trials, and so they're, they're kind of closing in on the promised land. But as God is, is having them move in, they're starting to conquer some of these, uh, these surrounding uh, peoples. And so God gives them victory and gives them a mighty defeats. There they, can, they can just whoop up on them. And so in, in all this time, we get up to chapter 22 in Numbers here. And so this kind of plays us up to where we're at here. But actually, before we go any further, let me go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you just... Uh, Work all things to your honor and glory. And Lord, help us to, uh, to always be focused on you for everything that we do. Lord, we're just, we're just a, whole, a whole mess of stuff and just a, just a bunch of sinners. But uh, I am so thankful that we can repent of the sins, ask Christ to be our Savior and be born again. And you have afforded that way of salvation to us. And you're so worthy and we're so unworthy. And we just praise you for all that you've done, going to do, and ask that you just work and God direct in all things. We want to give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, so we start here in 22, and verse number 1. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab, in this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And if you 
go down in the, the previous chapter, it talks, they just, they just annihilated them. Their mother, fa mothers, fathers, children, everything. They just wiped them out. They took them out. But that's what God directed them to do. And so as they're going across there, then Balak, he's, he's like, man, I got to do something. I got to do something. So as it's going on, we see in verse number three, well, in two, three, Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Midian, that's, that's a little bit familiar, isn't it? The Midianites? Hmm. Yeah. That's who, that's who Joseph was sold to. So, uh, so it's kind of it's a little bit of revenge, maybe. Huh? You think? I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is, you're talking 400 years later. But anyway, God's, I've heard it said, God's grindstone grinds slow but exceedingly fine. People think they can get away with stuff, but God, God keeps real good records. And so, as we see here, in, uh, pick up in verse number four there, after the elder, and Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, and the ox licketh up the grass of the field, and Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor at Pethor, uh, which is the river of the land of the children of his people, to, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they, are, they uh, cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, and curse this people, for they are too mighty for me. Preadventure uh, I shall prevail, that they may smite them, and they may drive them out of the land. For I want that he whom thou blessed blesseth is blessed, and whom thou cursed is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spake unto him uh, the words of Balak. And he said, unto, he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Now if we look at this, Balaam is not with the Israelites. Balaam is not a Hebrew. He is just, he's just a prophet for hire. He's one of these guys. And it even says, you know, it talks about Balaam. God talks to anybody, okay? And so he, he communicated with him, but he was, a, he was a prophet for hire. So he did it for his advantage. He always did stuff uh, to try to make out. And then we see what happens um, here with this. And so in verse number nine, we pick up, and God came to Balaam and said, what are these men with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which has covered the face of the earth. Come now, curse them, peradventure, I shall be able to, to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, that's pretty specific instructions that Balaam got. He said, You are not to do this. And so Balaam rose up in the morning, and he said, said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said to Balaam, and said, Balaam refuseth to come with us. And Balak sent yet more, uh, sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. So he sent another level of the, of the military or whatever, and uh, they came to Balaam. And um, they said unto Balak of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. So he's been a little bit more urgent in this request. He's wanting, he's said, uh, you know, you, you got to come to me. And so, for I will promote thee unto great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. <sighs> and then Balaam, there's Balaam again. He's prophet for hire. So he said, he answered and said unto the servants of Balak, And I will give thee, if thou, if Balak would give me this house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say uh, unto me more. So even though he knew, I mean, God, God's talking to you directly. And he says, eh, I'll go check again, you know. And he says, just, just hang out another night, and, and I'll see what God says. Well, 
What do you think? <laughs> and God says, came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. Now get this. He said, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do it. And Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princess of Moab. Did you notice something there? They didn't come to him. They didn't come to him at all. He went and met them. You know, so he's going to pay. He said, there's some money in this. Yeah. You know, so he thought, man, I can make, I can make some good stuff. Because he already said he's going to, he's silver, gold. I mean, this guy's rich. He's filthy rich. He's going to take care of me. But then, that's when the trouble begins. Amen. In verse number 20, God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord, here we go, stood in the way. The angel of the Lord stood in the way. There's a block. But, continue on. For, he put it for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and the two servants were with him. And, he, and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. This guy didn't see the angel of the Lord. He didn't see it. The ass did. The donkey, whatever you want to say. You know the first time I did this in junior church? Kids all said to me, sir, why are you cussing in church? I said, it's, it's in the Bible, okay? It's in the Bible. That's what they called them. That's what they are, all right? It's us that's made it, made it so bad, okay? And so anyway, the ass saw the angel in the way standing, uh, angel Lord standing in the way and with his sword drawn. I mean, he wasn't just standing in the way, but he had his sword in his hand and the ass turned aside and went out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass and turned her into the way. I mean, she's done turned to the side. She is not going toward that angel because that angel has a sword. I mean, that, that, that donkey, that ass, is seeing what's going on. This, this dumb, the dumb prophet, dumb Balaam, he couldn't see it. God's, the, 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 the ways of the world blind our eyes. And so what happens here, um, I mean, this, this, this ass, this donkey's done turned off to the side. And so he's, he's over there just beating her. He's like, get back over here. You got to go. We got, I got to go make some money. I got to go, go curse these people. I got to see what I can do. Verse number 24. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path in the vineyards, um, a wall being on this side and a wall being on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against, into the wall, onto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot in, against the wall. And he smote her again. Man, he's like, what is wrong with you, dumb animal? I mean, you have sat there and you have drove me into this, you know, and all this time, he ain't seeing that angel with the sword. And now it's a narrow way. There's no way to go. No way to go. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Man, she just dropped. Have you ever been on a horse and it just dropped under you? I mean, basically, that was his transportation. And this thing is done dropped under it. She, she's not going to the left, to the right. She's not ran, banging into the wall. She just dropped underneath him. And, man, he is furious. He is furious at these times. What is wrong with you? And so he's just whooping on her and beating on her. And this is when God has such a humor, doesn't he? He has such a humor. But when, when Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would that therefore were, or I would there were a sword in mine hand, and now I would kill thee. This is, this is good stuff. And the ass said unto Balaam, I mean, his dumb donkey is talking to him. And, I mean, she's talking. It's not just donkey language. She's talking human language. Man, wouldn't that just totally flip you out? I mean, you're sitting there just beating on this animal, beating on this animal, and the animal says, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Did you not see that angel? Did you not see his sword? I mean, we, we, done, we got pinched in here. And, I don't know, angel, Lord, I'm thinking it's a pretty... I think he's probably bigger than Shaq, you know? I'm thinking it's probably a pretty big being here that's blocking the road. I mean, this donkey is not going anywhere else. And so God allowed that, that donkey, that, that ass, to go ahead and talk. And it says, am, am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he say, nay. I mean, he's having a conversation with his donkey, and it doesn't even realize what's going on. He's so mad. He's so furious. He's talking with his donkey, and he's just having this conversation. 
And God says, this dummy is not going to get it. So what does he have to do? He has, verse 31, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. All of a sudden, the blinders were off. He's up. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. That angel's still in the way. And what does he do? He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. His sword was drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. I mean, he just, once he started to bow down, he just went all the way down. And it kind of reminds me when you think of when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they asked where Christ was. And he says, I am he. And they fell backwards to the ground. That's the power of God. God can do the impossible. We think, nah, where's the the wire? Where's the tricks? Where's all this stuff? God don't need that. It's, you know, we used to have a saying as a kid, my yard, my rules. So we'd make up the games, we'd, you know, make them a little bit. Oh, you can't do that here. That's my yard. My yard, we play this way, you know. It's God's yard. It's his rules. So uh, actually, it's God's world. But anyway, so in verse number 32, the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from these three times Unless she had turned from thee, surely now I would have slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou hast stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. No, no. The angel said, you're determined. You're going to do this. God gave me instruction. Go ahead. Just go ahead. So then, verse 35, And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So he went on to them. They ended up making these altars, and they, 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 they were over the top on the ridge of, and watching the, uh, the children of Israel. And every time he go out, he'd say, You slain seven oxen. You, you, slain, you, do, you keep doing this stuff. You keep making all these sacrifices, do all this stuff. And every time the word that came out of his mouth, I don't know if he was trying to curse them, do whatever, but every time he spoke, he blessed them. And Balak is like, What is wrong with you? He's like, I'm trying to get you to come up here and curse these people. I mean, if you are a prophet of God, take them out, do something, work your magic, do whatever. And every time he spoke, he just bless, God bless them. God bless, just bless, bless the children. And he just got madder and madder. And so what happens, you know, he ends up, they have to part their way. Nothing works out. All this stuff. Children of Israel go through. Now, granted, this is like 39 years. This is, they've been in the, in the desert, been going along. What do you think happens to Balaam? Anybody got a clue? Joshua. Let's go to Joshua. Let's go back a uh, couple of pages. Uh, 13. Joshua 13, 22. Joshua 13, 22. Joshua is now the big kahuna. I mean, he's, uh, Moses has passed off the scene. God's put Joshua in control. In 13, 22, we see what happens to the great Balaam. Great Balaam. As Joshua and them are conquering the land to set up everything for everybody there. In verse number 22, and Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer. They don't call him a prophet anymore. They call him a soothsayer. Um, Did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them? Didn't do him any good. Whatever he got, whatever he thought he was going to get riches and all that. I mean, things are temporal, but... It didn't do him any good. So, how many times was, was the angel in the way? Three times. And the ass had to, had to run off the trail, run him into the wall, and then drop under him. And he still didn't get it. Until the donkey's talking to him, he still didn't get it. And then whenever, finally, 
God opens his eyes and he sees the angel with the sword. Then he gets it. Why are we so stubborn? Us. I mean, so many times. I'm the same way. I mean, things happen and I'm just like, you know, whatever. You know, I can do this. I can, I can go through. But, you know, God says, nothing is impossible. But with me, all things are possible. God will take care of all situations. So, as we look at that, actually, that was my first point, and that was the wrong way. <laughs> so, which way are we in the way? Balaam went the wrong way. He was going the wrong way. And so there's several um, times through that we see that through the, through the Bible, through, the, through all Scripture, in these 99 times that that, that that phrase is mentioned, we see some negative connotations. And so, as we see um, all this stuff, oh, and that's, you know, to see how, how Balaam ended up, you know, that's just, that's just a bad deal. But when the, uh, let's see, Nahab was the son of Jeroboam, and uh, he was king over, over Israel. You know, when the, when the kingdom split, when they had Judah and Israel, um, Israel had a lot of bad kings. I mean, there's so many of them that were bad. And Jeroboam was, uh, he was one of the first ones there. And, and a lot of times down through, down through Scripture, you see a lot of them in the way, they do in the way of Jeroboam. He sinned in the way of Jeroboam. Jeroboam must have sinned pretty bad. I mean, he made the, made the people of Israel to sin. And so we see that, uh, that he walked in the wickedness of Israel. And so, so many times, four times, um, Nahab, or Nadab is mentioned in Kings, uh, 1 Kings 15, 26, and 34, and 1 Kings 16, 2, 19. And that's when he talks about Nadab, about the sins of Jeroboam. And he was in the way of Jeroboam. And also there's uh, Ahaziah, Ahaziah. You got to say these, uh, you got to, <laughs> Ahaziah. There we go. Ahaziah was the son of Ahab. Now Ahab was a very wicked king. I mean, he, he was so wicked, it was vile. And of course, uh, you know, his wife was uh, Jezebel. And it says here that Ahaziah, you got to say it that way, the son of Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord over Israel. He made them to walk in the way of his father, his mother, and Jeroboam. I mean, they, it, it lists all these out. And then there's several that come on after this that they even talk about in the way of, of Ahab, in the way of Jeroboam. I mean, that's not a good legacy to have if you walk in the way of these evil kings. I mean, I, don't, I don't, do not want to see, uh, I don't want anybody, you know, to be a distraction in a way and be in the wrong way. I, I, I want to be in the right way. And uh, the second time, the second point here, the, the first one's the wrong way. The second one's the willing way. So are you willing? Are you willing? You know, sometimes we just, you know, we just see how things go. We have uh, Abraham's servant. Abraham's servant went to go get Rebecca. And so... Um, you know, Abraham had been traveling the land, been going around, all these things that happened and all that stuff. And so he has a son, Isaac, and then he tells him, you know, his, his, uh, he's getting up in age. And he said, tells his servant, he said, you go to the land of my fathers and you go get a bride for my son. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of a, the weird thing about the tradition there is they always said you put your hand under his thigh. That's, I guess that sealed the deal. I don't know what it was, but, you know, you put the hand under the thigh, and that says you're doing it. You know, I guess in, in our modern, modern culture, it was sh it's shaking the hand, kind of used to seal the deal when you did stuff. Now people just, they don't even believe contracts. You know, they just <laughs> do whatever. But um, anyway, he, he put his hand under his thigh, went in the way, went to go, uh, traveled to where he was supposed to go, ended up there, drew water out of the well, and lo and behold, there's Rebecca. And... Uh, the servant of Abraham said, praise be to God. I mean, it's, he, was, he said, I was in the way. I was in the way. I went in the right way. I went in the way that my, my master told me to go. And in Psalms 1-1, it says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or, or in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. We don't need to be a block for sinners. We need to help people. To, to the cross. We need to help people to, to salvation and to show them that there is, this world is dark and dying and there's nothing good in this world. This, it's all going to burn up. I mean, look at today. Look how warm it got. But this is nothing compared to hell. It's nothing compared to what hell's going to be. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a scorcher. It's going um, to be unreal. 
and, and the pain and torment and everything like there. So again, I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. 1 Corinthians um, 8, 9 talks about that. It talks about not being a stumbling block. I want to be in the right way. I don't want to be in the wrong way. Psalms 139 in, 20, in 22 and 23. I think y'all might know that one. You know that one? You know, you know that song? You know that one? We sing it. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So now when we sing that song, you think about in the way. Lead me in the way everlasting. Help me to lead others in the way everlasting. So next time we sing that song, you think about be in the way, be in the right way, be in the right way, pointing sinners to the cross of Calvary. We need to point people to the right, right direction. Taste and see what the Lord can do. So that was be in the willing way. We'd be willing to be pointed in the right direction. And in the, in the third point, it's a fulfilling way. So you, when you fulfill, when you, get the, when you get to the end result of everything, that's where you see Matthew 21, 32. Jesus is talking there uh, about John the Baptist. He's talking to him there, and he came to you in the way of righteousness. He's talking to, to the people there in Jerusalem, and he's, t- he's preaching to them. And he said, you wouldn't believe you know, the harlots and the, and the prostitutes and, and the, the publicans and all that stuff. They believe John. They got saved. But you people of the hierarchy, you people of the, of the, the, the upers, the upper echelon, you, you, wouldn't, you didn't want to listen to John the Baptist. But he was in the way of righteousness. He was telling you about me as Jesus Christ was coming. And so he was, he was in the right way. But ye believe me not. But that's what we need to do. We need to be telling people of the righteousness of God. Jesus not only in, was in the way of righteousness, he is... Let's back up a bit. When Moses was in the desert, 40 years, he's on the backside of the desert. Why did Moses go to the desert? Because he's running from Pharaoh. Because he killed a man and buried him in the sand. How long do you think that's going to last? Amen. <laughs> you know, it's like, like that. Then the next day, the Israelites are like, you know, you're going you're gonna to kill us like you did that Egyptian? You're going to smote him? Smote us like you smote him? And all of a sudden, then Moses is like, I got to go. I'm in trouble. And so he went to the backside of the desert, and um, he ends up hanging out with Jethro and gets a wife and and just goes merry on with life, and then he goes up to a bush. He's out there just being a shepherd, just doing you know his shepherding thing, and he goes to see this bush burning, and he said, there's no fire. There's, what's going on there? And so as he goes up there to it, God speaks to him and says, remove thy foot from where thy stand. Move, remove their shoes from where you stand. You're standing on holy ground. And so as he went there, and he says, well, who, how am I going to go to Pharaoh? Pharaoh wants to kill me. Pharaoh, and so he laid out the plan for me and said, he said, who am I going to say that, that, that's doing this? And he says, you say the I am. It's the I am. And so we see that Jesus is the I am of the way. He completes the deal. I mean, he it wraps it all up. We see that Jesus is the, is the way. In John 14, 6, he is the I am. He is the, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only way. He's the only way. The way is straight and narrow, but it, it you know, they, they always, the one saying is all roads lead to Rome, you know, back in the old day. But uh, that was a Roman Empire. But there's only one road that leads to salvation, and that's through the, through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that Jesus was, is, and always will be there when sinners call. I'm glad he is the I am of the way. So which way are you in the way? Are you in the way the wrong way? Are you, you pushing people away from Christ? I mean, do the, does our life, our example of our life, does it show a bad testimony? I mean, there's things that we need to, we need to do. We need, to, we need to, to show. We need to be reflections of Christ. Are we in the willing way? Are we willing to help people? I mean, you know, I've heard a, a guy years ago said about, you know, when you, when you uh, he was saying that there was a family in his church. This was a guy that was an evangelist, and he said, I cannot stand this family in my church. He said, they are so, they just, they just give me grief all the time. 
And he said, he was praying to God and said, what do I do with these people, God? I, I can't stand them. I can't stand them. Every time I turn around, they're just jabbing me in the back, doing all this stuff. And God said, uh, let, me, let me take care of that. And he said, I don't, you know, I know you can. I know you will. And he says, why don't you be willing to let me take care of it? And so that's sometimes just having that willing heart to let God use us. And so that's what we need. We need to have that willing way and let God do the work and do the direction in our life. Now, the fulfilling way, that's only one. There's only one. There's a, there's a great void. There was a great void in my life before I got saved. I mean, I, I, you search for everything. You, you do anything to try to get to, to people do anything. They'll do drugs, alcohol, do whatever, and, and think, and I, it's not just that. It's material things. Some people worship their vehicles. I used to, I used to worship motorcycles. I'm sorry, Brother John, but I did. <laughs> I would eat, drink, drink, sleep. I mean, I did everything about, about anything about a motorcycle. And anything in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, I could tell you born stroke. I could tell you everything about everything. I mean, I was just, I lived for that stuff. And I said, man, you just, just throw my leg across one and just let her rip and go. And, uh, there's nothing like airing one out. I mean, I love I loved jumping, jumping mine because motocross, it was fun. It was really, I still do it today, but Sheila won't let me. She won't let me get one. She said, no, no. And so, because uh, I got a Kawasaki mule, I, I get to jump the terraces every now and then. So, but the four-wheeler, you know, it just, it don't, it's not as good. <laughs> but, uh, amen. But just be where God wants you to be and let him do the work in the direction we need to be. Because God is so good, he's so worthy, and we're so unworthy of all that we do. Well, amen. So we got through that. It's ABCs of salvation. Admit, believe, confess. I'm glad that one day when I got that peace, I used to have the dream before I got saved that I was always falling. Because I would race a motocross up Finger Lakes. Man, there was a little tabletop. You come off about 20 feet, and then you hit a little ledge, and you went another 20 feet. It was, it was the funnest thing ever. I mean, you just get so much air off of that thing. And I'd have this dream where I would be falling and falling and falling. And I'd wake up just going into a dark abyss. Just, uh, and I was like, man, what is the deal? And so I, I fought it and fought it and fought it. When I came, every time I came to church, Brother Riker down there in the old building, and I'd tell Sheila, I said, what have you been telling Brother Riker? Every time I turn around, he's, he's preaching at me. He's just, he's just, just camping on my, on my stuff here. And uh, she's, I ain't saying nothing to him. It's the Holy Spirit talking to you. And uh, the more I resisted, the more I tried to put other things into it, there's no peace. There's no peace until I finally surrendered. At 1030 on a Sunday night, somewhere about in this area, in Brother Riker's little trailer in, in, at his coffee, coffee uh, table. And uh, I tell you what, I've never looked back. There's been some rough times. There have been some times when things are, things are you know, you think, man, what in the world, God, what are you doing? But at least I got somebody to take me through it. At least I got somebody to go with, amen? Somebody that's going to carry me through. He'll, he'll not give us any more than what we can take, what we can bear. He, he wants to be our burden bearer. So all we got to do is give it to him, and he'll take care of it. But not that this road, this rose, this road is going to be a bed of roses. I mean, there's going to be some trials and tribulations along the way. Who are we to think that we, there's people in China that, that, if they open their Bible, they, if they have a Bible, they could be killed. You know, we, we've got it so good. We've got it so good. And, um, man, people preserve, try to do everything they do to, to, to get, get this all out. And yet God just, he's so good. He's so good. He threads us through so many times, so many things. When I look back and think situations in my life and I see, God, you got me through that. Quick instance, and this will be the last one. I was, uh, I was working on, on, a, on a project survey up in, around Kingdom City, and uh, I was coming back, and I had my trailer and my truck and, and uh, coming up out of this hill, and man, I'm just, I'm tired. I've been there like 10, 12 hours, and we've been chopping brush and doing all kinds of stuff to try to get this, this thing done, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm going over this little valley, and I hit this little bridge, and I start up this hill, and all of a sudden, pow, man, my... And the truck starts rolling backwards. <laughs> I said, oh, boy, <laughs> this ain't good. And, I mean, it's that, I blew my transmission up. Uh, there was nothing left. The guy said when he took it apart, just pieces fell out. 
They just fell out. And uh, anyway, I called the guy. I just left his house. I wasn't even a mile from his house. And this guy, it was actually the guy sitting next to me their Sunday, Phil Friend. And uh, you pray for him. He's had a, he had, their little boy was born like June 10th, first part of June, and he's three weeks early and had to be, you know, he's a preemie. So they had to, you know, put him, incubate him, kind of cook him a little longer, amen. But he's doing fine now. He's, he's at home and everything. But uh, so I called Phil, and I said, man, I'm, I'm just up the road. I didn't make it very far. And he's like, I will take care of it. And, man, we went, that's back when the rain was stuff. So we went to his house, got in there, got stuck in his field. It was, a, it, was, it was a deal, man. I'm telling you, it was a night. And as I'm going home, I think, God, why did we do this? Why did all this happen? And then I thought, you know, two days earlier, I was up in Moberly with my truck and Sheila and Derek, and we were getting a load of auction stuff. Thank the Lord that didn't happen somewhere on 63. And I was a long way from nowhere where I wouldn't have got any help. I mean, God is so good. He just gets us out of things. And sometimes we need to look back and reflect where God has taken us from and gotten us out of situations. Man, he's so good. We don't need, I mean, my guardian angel, he's got to be beat up, man. I mean, it's, <laughs> he's, he's went through quite a, quite a few things. But through it all, God's been good. Isn't he? He's good. So be, which way are you in the way? Which way are you, are you the, the wrong way, the willing way, or the fulfilling way? And uh, I'm glad that God's, God's just, he's so worthy. He's so worthy. Well, let's, uh, let's just have a little time of, of reflection and a little bit of... Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here of Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus, he came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this, you must be born again. In John chapter three, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me, even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I'd be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.